So now that we've seen uh, how Lagrangian is useful, let's, kind of, let's see how that we can actually use this property to solve uh, for our equations of motion. So back in the 18th century, um, Leonard Euler, who you've probably all heard of, uh, was also around, and him and Lagrange collaborated on some things, one of these being uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation, which I will show here. It looks a bit scary, I know, please don't turn off. Um, it's actually a remarkably simple equation for the systems that we're looking at and you already know how to deal with everything here. So probably the weirdest thing about this uh, is the Q. So this Q uh, sim is simply re re representing our coordinate. So I said previously uh, that we're not restricted to just using our X and our Y Cartesian coordinates. We can use any, we can use the angle of our pendulum. Um, and there's plenty of other different systems too. So this Q uh, is simply representing that. So for example, uh, in the case of a pendulum, then our Q, our coordinate would be our angle here. If we're thinking about uh, a ball falling down uh, under the uh, influence of a gravitational field, remember our Lagrangian was L equals a half M Y dash, uh, Y dot squared minus uh, M G Y. So uh, our coordinates are Y, and y dot. So instead of writing q, we could just write y and y dot. So um, I'll keep on going now and I'll show you how you can solve this and get the equations of motion so you can predict the behavior of a system. Okay, so now I'm going to use this equation up here. It's called the Euler-Lagrange equation that I've already spoken to you about to solve the Lagrangian here for the equations of motion uh, of a, an object falling under a gravitational field. It's a lot of big words, I know, but trust me, it's a lot easier than it might seem at first. So, let's break this equation down. Ordinarily, uh, when you look at it, you'd go, okay, what is this Q? But we, re we remember that Q simply re represents our coordinate. So here, I have Y and Y dot as my two coordinates. So, let's differentiate my Lagrangian with respect to my y. And we can see, uh, so these um, these funny things at the front, these are partial derivative symbols, so don't worry about them, just treat them like you would normal derivatives. Um, so in this case, we look at this and we're like, okay, cool, well, there's no y here, there's a y dot, but we're considering them as separate in this case. So there's no y, it's y here. So differentiating that results in negative mg. Now let's have a look over here. So we want the time derivative of the derivative of the Lagrangian to our dq dot. So let's first of all take the derivative of the Lagrangian dy dot. And again, same thing, we get my dot. And now let's take the time derivative of this. So d dt of my dot simply becomes uh, our m. Obviously, if we differentiate it with respect to time, nothing happens, uh, so we don't need to worry about it. However, this does depend on time, so this would become m y double dot. Uh, and this double dot signifies uh, the fact that this is the second time derivative of y. So if we've differentiated it once to get y dot, and we're differentiating it again to get m y double dot. Okay, so now let's put this uh, and this together into uh, this equation up here. So we have negative mg is equal to my double dot. So we remember that y double dot, that's simply the acceleration. So actually this is ma, so I'll just swap these around, equals negative mg, or we can say f equals negative mg. And we can see here that this is exactly what we would expect. So f equals mg, which is what we would expect from a, an object falling um, under the influence of a gravitational field. So you can see that Lagrangian mechanics, uh, when we step through the whole thing, formulate the Lagrangian, write this down, uh, we do end up with uh, our Newtonian falling out quite nicely.